Hi everyone, welcome to the March 5th edition of the Timeform US Forecast. I'm David Aragon, and I'll be joined in just a minute by my co-host, Craig Mulkowski. It's a loaded weekend of stakes racing across the country. Three Kentucky Derby preps taking place at three different venues. We've got the Gotham in New York, the Tampa Bay Derby at Tampa Bay Downs, and the San Felipe out at Santa Anita. We'll talk about all three of those Derby preps, along with some undercard stakes on all of those uh, race cards, uh, beginning with Aqueduct. We'll do the Busher the Tom Fool leading up to the Gotham Stakes. Then we'll move on to the Tampa Bay Downs, where we'll discuss the Hillsborough, a very interesting turf race for Phillies and Mares, leading up to the Tampa Bay Derby. And at Santa Anita, well, I kind of misspoke because the San Felipe is not exactly the leading stakes on that card. That's the Santa Anita Handicap card. The San Felipe is part of the undercard stakes races. We'll begin with that three-year-old stakes, then talk about the Frank E. Kilrow Mile, another grade one event leading up to that Santa Anita Handicap at the end of the card at Santa Anita. So, Craig, Eight stakes races to talk about, a lot to get through, and I think this is a weekend where it's justified to do a little skipping around because there are many stakes to discuss. Yeah, I would argue this is probably the best uh, best overall week of the year we've had in racing with three uh, three pretty big cards at different parts around the country. So really looking forward to diving into this one. I think there's some really exciting races, both as a fan of the sport and as a better. I think there's some good opportunities. So just a, a fun weekend. Let's get right into it. And at first glance, the Aqueduct card might seem like it's maybe a step below in terms of quality. The cards at Tampa Bay Dance and Santa Anita. And there are some smaller fields in these stakes races, but I found all of these stakes at Aqueduct leading up to the Gotham to be really interesting handicapping races, some deep competitive fields. And that kicks off with the Busher race six on Aqueduct Saturday card. Three-year-old fillies in a Kentucky Oaks prep going the one-turn mile, the same distance as the Gotham. And we've got two... Phillies who are likely to vie for favoritism in here, Miss Brazil and Mo Desserts, who actually won back-to-back races on the February 8th card at Aqueduct. Miss Brazil was a stakes winner on that card, taking down the Ruthless, but she only beat a couple of rivals in that race. Mo Desserts was a blowout winner uh, against Maidens by uh, about 15 lengths or more. Uh, they're both going to be answering some questions here as Miss Brazil stretches out in distance and Mo Desserts faces winners for the first time, but you can make a case for the four others as well. Just a very competitive field. Yeah, it is for sure. And the two horses you mentioned, I mean, I think there's a very real possibility that they could cause problems for each other. Uh, both have shown high speed in, in all of their wins and went wire to wire. Uh, I think there's a good case could be made that February 8th track kind of favored speed horses as well. So while obviously I think either one of them could win, I'm going to take a shot trying to beat them in here. Um, I should mention there is no flag on the pace projector, but I do think it's a solid speed race. I, I don't think anybody's going to steal it up on the front end. Uh, I guess the logical alternative will be the third choice on your morning line in search party, but I'm always a little leery of these Chad Brown horses. Uh, he wins 25% in spots like this, maiden winners jumping into uh, stakes competition, but they only win 57, uh, return 57 cents on the dollar. So that's not something for me to get too excited about since they typically get over bet. So I'm going to look even elsewhere, go a little further out, and that's with Laubin on a prayer. Uh, she's a filly who was in good form. She had two romping wins, one against New York Breads, uh, actually both against New York Breads. One was at New York Stallion Series, which was they're always labeled a little bit differently. But when she moved into, um, in, that, in her last race, uh, once again against New York Breds, uh, she was the heavy favorite. But I just didn't really think she handled the track that day. I, I think six and a half furlongs is getting a little short for her. Uh, I think she was really moving in the right direction. I, I think she can compete with these. So she's going to be my top pick as, as a value play. I mean, I'm not saying she's the most likely winner in here. But I really do like her getting back to the mile, getting off that muddy track where that I think she struggled with it. and I think she's got a shot yeah, we're pretty much on the same page in this race. I think Mo Desserts could be very talented, and Miss Brazil has already proven that she is quite talented, uh, but I'm not sure that this is the right spot for either of them, or at least to take either one at a short price. Miss Brazil, I was very impressed with her maiden victory two back. The Ruthless, it was what it was. Just two horses ran. Basically, only one other horse even finished the race, so just not the most competitive spot. I'm just very concerned about Miss Brazil stretching out an extra furlong to a mile. 
Um, she strikes me as a pure sprinter, and I get why they're running in this spot. There's a $250,000 purse. You have to take a shot, even if she's not really a Kentucky Oaks type of filly. I just think she's ultimately going to be best sprinting in the future. And furthermore, that February 8th track, um, it's color-coded red in the race rating box and the time form USPP is indicating a speed track. To me, as the day wore on, it looked like it was one of those days at Aqueduct where the rail got very strong. Um, perhaps not so much at the beginning of the day and the, the, these two races that Mo Desserts and Miss Brazil ran and were in the first half of the card. But by the end of the day, the rail was a significant advantage. And both of these horses, Miss Brazil and Mo Desserts, did ride the rail. So take that for what it's worth. Mo Desserts, I think a mile is a perfect distance for her. She might even want to go farther in the future. This is just such a significant class test. And that victory last time, the margin of, uh, of victory, um, it, it was really exaggerated, I think, by the way the track might have been playing by that time in the day. So I'm a little skeptical of her stepping up in class. Uh, we're on the same page about search results. Not sure the value is going to be there, but I did like her debut. Just think um, she's uh, going to have to step up and run a little faster. And we landed on the same alternative in Lao Ben on a prayer. Um, everything you said, I think there's 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 reason to like her for those uh, those points. And the one thing that I would add to it is that if you're reading uh, the Naira Stakes advance uh, and the quotes from her trainer, Dan Velasquez, he was saying that he had a lot of trouble training her leading up to that Franklin Square last time. And you could even see it in the PPs. She only had one workout in between that New York Stallion Stakes victory back in early December and that Franklin Square in mid-January. And he said that she's been training much better into this busher. And furthermore, I like her stretching out in distance. I think a mile is a much better distance for her than six and a half furlong so regardless of whether it was the track or not that uh, upset her last time i think that this is going to be the right spot for her and i think she might be talented enough to handle open company so uh she's going to be my top pick as well Moving on to the next race at Aqueduct, the seventh on this Saturday card. It's the Tom Fool grade three event going six furlongs for the older horses and another pretty competitive six horse field. Um, I think you can make a pretty strong case for at least four, maybe five of these runners. Uh, the, the favoritism is likely to be down towards the inside in the number two share the ride who, I mean, what can you say wrong about this horse? He he just seems to run every two weeks. He always shows up, doesn't always win, but he always comes forth with a competitive effort. He's coming off one of his particularly good efforts in the General George, where he uh, won a grade three event. He's back in grade three company this time, and he's got a versatile running style. So there's just a lot to like about this likely favorite. Yeah, there is. But I'll be honest, for me, he just hasn't run all that fast. I do think he's a, a contender in here for sure, just because he always seems to be in the mix turning for home. But I do worry he just hasn't run those big speed figures we usually see from sprinters. Uh, I'll start with Chateau in here. He's a horse who ran a monster figure last out. He's one that's been known to do that from time to time, particularly when he gets clear as he did in that allowance race where he beat secret rules. He's always gasping for air at the end. It's just a matter of if he's opened up a big enough lead. Uh, in this case, I, I do think Happy Farm is going to cause him some problems. Obviously, he hasn't been the same horse from a speed perspective, uh, speed figure perspective as he was in the Jason Service Barn uh, since he's moved to the Linda Rice Barn. But he did show high speed early last time, uh, 134 pace figure. And if Chateau has to go that faster, faster, I, I think it's going to be problems for him. So Chateau's the kind, even though he has that big speed figure, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of. And even if Happy Farm doesn't challenge him, I'm still skeptical just because of the, the raising class. And sometimes the numbers can't reflect everything. And he's just a horse who, when he faces better horses, just doesn't know. He gets a little weak in the knees and, and doesn't finish his races off. The horse I really do like in here is the one on the outside, and that's Wendell Fong. He was a horse. He won the Gold Fever Stakes as a three-year-old back at Belmont. I mean, it seems like a, a million years ago to me, and he just went way off form. He, he was terrible for a long stretch. But then two races back in allowance at Laurel, he, he showed some of his old form, got back to a 113 time form U.S. speed figure. And last time he just exp exploded in a race at Laurel at Fire Plug Stakes, where among his victims that they was shared a ride, he got a 119, which is better than 
anybody in here's run recently save Chateau. And I just don't think it was a fluke. I think this is a horse who has always been talented. He uh, showed that early on in his career. I have no idea what went wrong with him, but whatever it was seems to be straightened out by his uh, trainer, Natalia Lynch. And I just don't think that last was a fluke. I, I think he's going to get plenty of pace in here with Chateau, and I expect a good effort from him. Yeah, I think based on all the speed in the race, it definitely is going to set up for Wendell Fogg, and he's definitely one of the contenders in here. Um, I'm with you on his last race. I, I like that effort quite a bit, and he beat Share the Ride fair and square, and he had run some pretty impressive speed figures in the past. As you said, he was just pretty inconsistent and he still has to prove that he can maintain that consistency that he showed in his last couple starts uh, because he, he, he's run well and then fallen apart again before. Um, I, I was reading that um, Natalia Lynch said that she elected to, to turn him out on a farm for a little while after that last race and he's only had one work since then. So I'm a little concerned that maybe he's not fully cranked up for this race because I know they're pointing for the Carter. So maybe this is just a prep for that. So um, I'm sure they're trying to win, but I just wonder a little bit about whether he's ready to pop such a, a huge effort like he did last time, though he does figure to get the right pace set up here. Um, I, I wasn't going to get too creative in here. I was kind of deciding between the two horses down towards the inside, share the ride and Pete's play call. They're both going to be affected if Chateau runs off on the lead and sets an extremely fast pace because they'll both be forced to rate in that situation from inside post positions. But share the ride. I mean, he's shown that versatility in the past. He can come from a little off the pace and some might look and see that he rated two back and wasn't able to catch Pete's play call. I thought that they gave him a foolish ride two back because that was a race, um, the toboggan that had no pace at all. And they elected to take him off the pace. Um, it's going to be a different situation in this Tom Fool with more speed up front. So I think share the ride could get the right trip. And I have very few knocks on Pete's play call as well. He's a versatile type with that stalking running style with tactical speed. Um, he just lost to American power last time, but that's a horse who was in very good form at the time. Um, and again, he's a horse just kind of like share the ride that has speed figures that are in the one teens, maybe not as high as some others have run like Chateau, but I agree with everything you said, Craig. I don't expect Chateau to run that number against this level of competition. So I think Pete's play call and share the ride are good enough to win this kind of race just comes down to the trip. Let's move on to that derby prep in New York, the grade three Gotham offering 50 Kentucky Derby qualifying points to the winner. Like all three of these prep races are around the country on Saturday. We're going the one turn mile for the three-year-olds. And I think this is a very interesting Gotham. This race doesn't always come up the strongest in the past few years, but I think we have some talented horses in the mix this time, perhaps not derby horses. I don't know if they all want to go a mile and a quarter, but I think some horses that do fit very well going this one turn mile distance and Leading the charge is Chad Brown, who's just been in the midst of a stellar meet at Aqueduct, and he's shipping him highly motivated from Florida. This horse looked great to me, winning the Nyquist at the end of his two-year-old season, and this just seems like the logical next step, stretching out from sprints to go the one-turn mile. There's just a lot to like about this horse. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to like about a couple horses in here for for. I, I thought I would say for some reason, but I mean, there's good reason for it. Anytime I see a Bob Baffert horse ship into New York for one of these races, I gravitate to them first. And it, it caused me to look him up in, in Formulator and see his stats. And when Bob Baffert, Bob Baffert ships into New York for a graded stakes race, he's 20 for 40 and he gives you a profit of 72 cents on the dollar. So I think Freedom Fighter's got to be considered a serious player. Uh, he's probably obviously trying to avoid some of his other bigger horses that are in the San Felipe that we're going to talk about later. But he's a horse that's done very little wrong in his career so far, and I certainly give him a big shot and I'm not going to dismiss him. Uh, highly motivated, as you said, to the other when he won that Nyquist Stakes at Keeneland, and that's been proven to be a very strong race. It's already produced three next out winners. It was uh, a field that he didn't just win, that he won easily. Uh, so for for me, it really comes down to these two horses. Uh, I guess there's a few you could make a case for. Uh, Capo Kane, we've seen him a couple times already this year. Uh, he's improved every time out, but it's hard for me to envision him getting a better trip than he did in his last couple. And the last time out in the Withers, he wasn't able to hold on or even hold second. So of the horses that 
maybe are going to take some money. I'd be most against him. And Crowded Trade is the other Chad Brown horse in here. And, I mean, he's got every right to improve. He wouldn't shock me. But there was a pretty big gap in speed figures uh, between him and his stable mate. And his race was run in January, whereas Highly Motivated ran back in November. So that gap's probably even a little bigger than the raw numbers would tell you. So I, I just prefer Highly Motivated and Freedom Fighter. If I had to make a top pick, I, I'm going to go with the Bob Baffert horse just based on those numbers. He ran a little faster last time than we've seen from Highly Motivated, though, as I said, uh, Highly Motivated's race did come, uh, I guess it's almost five months ago now. So if you want to give him uh, some extra credit for that, but it, it's just the value thing for me. I think Freedom Fighter gets a perfect post. He's going to sit just off a of Capo Keen and, and I would take him slightly over highly motivated. Before I get into my thoughts, I just want to wrap up Freedom Fighter and get your take on the fractions and time of his last race, because I know there was a timing issue, and I saw some people saying that maybe he set a slow pace last time. Th that's not the case, because the, 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 the times that are and the fractions that are posted in the chart, they're not correct, right? No, that was when Santa Anita was really struggling timing their six and a half and seven furlong races. It has been remedied. I guess Trackus went out and did some maintenance, but at the time I was timing all the races from video and uh, the fractions were just way off. For, at every call, final times were off. I mean, it, it had to open some eyes when you saw a 2341 out at Santa Anita. I know the track isn't playing like it's 1995 or anything, but there's no way those horses went that slow so his pace figures were solid he actually ran a 133 opening quarter mile so no it was definitely not a slow pace yeah, I think Freedom Fighter ran well on that San Vicente last time. I mean, I'm not sure how much I really think of the horse that beat him concert tour. I know some people have them him in their top 10 or top 5 derby lists. I wouldn't go that far. I'm not sure he's quite that good. Um, but Freedom Fighter did run a fast race there. My biggest concern with Freedom Fighter is the distance, the, the stretching out to a mile, because... Even Bob Baffert has said that he kind of gets the feeling this horse is a sprinter, he's built like a sprinter, and he's taken a shot here, but I, I really do think this horse is ultimately going to be best going six, six and a half furlongs. Um, his damn Canadian ballet was a pure sprinter, like a five and a half furlong turf sprinter, and to me, this horse looks all sprint. Um, maybe he gets the mile. I mean, this is the kind of spot you want for a sprinter stretching out, but I'm just a little skeptical that he can get away with the kind of pace that he needs because there is plenty of other speed in here as the pace projector indicates. Uh, and you touched upon a few of them, including Capo Kane. So I'm just a little bit skeptical of Freedom Fighter. I respect Bob Baffert's numbers and I am picking against both of the horses that Bob Baffert's shipping to New York this weekend. We didn't even touch on Speed Pass and the Tom Fool. I was against him as well. Um, but I'm just not sure that this is the right spot for either of, the, either of these horses. Um, I landed on highly motivated. Nothing clever for me within this race. He just seems like uh, a horse that's liable to take a step forward in his three-year-old debut. I liked everything that he that I saw from him last year. It wasn't just the Nyquist. I liked both of his maiden races at, at Saratoga and Belmont, especially that maiden breaking score two back when he beat Known Agenda. Um, he just seems like the kind of horse that that's supposed to take a step forward in his three-year-old debut. Not saying that I love him for the Kentucky Derby. I don't know if he wants to go a mile and a quarter, but I think the guy them is the right kind of spot for him as for chad brown's other horse crowded trade um i think he could get a piece of this race i know that chad brown was initially looking to run him in a nominers of one allowance race that didn't fill on this card so the gotham is kind of plan b for this horse but his debut was pretty impressive i mean he he did run a lower speed figure but keep in mind he blew the start of that race and and was off of two to three lines slowly um it's not noted in the short comment but there was kind of a traffic jam at the start that affected this horse. That's why he was so far back in the early going. And he made a long, sustained run to get into the race and pass the leader who looked home free at the top of the stretch. So I was impressed by this horse, and he's got a pedigree to improve with added distance. So I would take him seriously as well in here. I wasn't thrilled with the other California shipper wipe the slate and cop okay. And I'm just not sure that he's good enough. So I was going to lean towards the Chad Brown runners, and, and I put highly motivated on top. Yeah, I did want to mention Wipe the Slate. He's a horse. I, I'm not going to bet him in this spot. I, I don't think he has... With 
it's just not a good setup for him with plenty other speed. But I think it will be interesting to see how he runs, particularly with the San Felipe coming up later on the uh, card, because he was battling with uh, that Medina spirit in that Lewis, and that was just a wicked fast pace. So he had every right to give it up. And it wouldn't surprise me if he runs much better than what his running line looked that day. Let's shift venues and move over to Tampa Bay Downs, where they are running that derby prep on Saturday. But leading up to that um, is the Grade 2 Hillsboro going a mile and an eighth on the turf course for the Phillies and Mares. And this is a highly competitive Grade 2 event. You can make a case for a lot of runners in this race. I don't blame the morning line maker for going as high as 4-1 to one with the favorite counterparty risk. We'll see who the public ends up going for in this race, because I think there are a number of horses that could go favored in this spot. Um just a really difficult race to assess from a class perspective, and you've got a few coming off layoffs as well. It's hard to even know where to start. Yeah, that's the same thing I noticed when I was looking. The first thing I always do in our past performances at Timeform US is I just take a look at the preview page, glance at the power picks, the pace projector, and the spotlight figures. Now, granted, the spotlight figures are kind of shaky. I mean, they can be from as many as five races ago. But the first thing I noticed is that all 10 horses in the main field had spotlight figures of 110 to 120. So pretty evenly matched feel. You, you don't often see that. There's no notation on the pace projector uh, so it does look to be an honest pace um I hope you're right about the prices because you know I hate going with the shorter prices in races like this and particularly in big fields but the two that interest me the most are the two drawn inside uh magic attitude from the rail I think she ran well in both starts as a three-year-old she won that Belmont Oaks uh she ran well in the QE2 cup at Keeneland and she, her speed figures look maybe a tiny bit light compared to the other horse I'm going to talk about. But she is a four-year-old, so I would expect those to improve a little bit. The other horse on the inside, the, the two horses, Counterparty Risk, who won the Endeavor at Tampa on Sam Davis Day. And I just really like how she finished that race. I think you have to throw the times out the window. The pace was just so incredibly slow that, that there was no way to really make a good speed figure. So I am a little skeptical of that 120 speed figure, but it showed the dominance she had closing over the other horses. Um, if I have to pick one of the two, though, I'm going to go with Magic Attitude. I, I just think she was running against much better competition, even as a three-year-old. Uh, Harvey's Little Goyle, we saw her run third, I think it was, in the uh, Philly and Mare Turf as a three-year-old. Uh, Antoinette came back to win last week at Gulfstream, the horse she beat in the Belmont Oaks. So at that 9-2 to two morning line, I, I would like her quite a bit compared to some of the others. Yeah, I was kind of against both of the favorites in this race. I, I, I went a different direction. I mean, I, counterparty risk, I hear you with the, the pace bonus she got last time and the speed figure, and she did run well closing into that slow pace, but... I think there are off the pace trips that are better. Some are better than others. And she got one of those off the pace trips that couldn't have worked out more perfectly because she was only three and a half lengths back in the early going. And just the Red Seas parted for her at the top of the stretch. I mean, a horse was drifting out and carried out her main rival, New York Girl. And there was a huge opening for counterparty risk to come through. So while she did come from off the pace and close fairly well, she got a great trip in doing it. So I'm not sure how much I really want to upgrade that performance. And to me, the 120 fig is, I know that's just how the algorithm works for our figures. To me, that's going overboard on her. Um, so I, I don't think she's really at that level. And I would I would downgrade her a little bit off that performance. As for Magic Attitude, I, I have trouble taking her in here because while she was visually impressive winning that Belmont Oaks two back, Craig, you know that I'm not the biggest fan of Antoinette. I know that she's overachieved and maybe I've just been wrong about her, but um, I'm not going to give a horse too much credit for beating that one. And last time out in the QE2, she was the favorite. And I think it's pretty cut and dry that Micheline just ran the better race. I mean, Magic Attitude got a perfect trip saving ground. She tipped out at the right time at the top of the stretch, got the jump on Micheline when she cut the corner. And Micheline, who got a wide trip every step of the way, just came back and beat her at the end. So 
I'm not sure why I'm supposed to like Magic Attitude more than Micheline. Um, as for Micheline, who's 8-1 to one in the morning line in here, I don't know if we're going to get that price. But to me, she seems like a major contender in this race. She will have to work out a trip from the outside post position. And I'm not sure how much speed is going to be in this race. But I do like that she was closer to the pace last time in the QE2. She doesn't have to be as far back as she sometimes is. So I'm hoping that Luis Saez gets her a little more involved in the early going because she does have a little bit of tactical speed. And she some, some a bit of a grinder type. She doesn't have the turn of foot of a horse like Magic Attitude, but going a mile and an eighth, I think that she can outstay some of these. And to me, she's just a logical major contender in this race. Yeah, I have no problem with her. The big knock I have was the post that you mentioned. I, I think in these two-term turf routes, the difference between the one post and 11 post is probably a couple lengths. So while she may have run better than her at Kingland, I, I'm not sure she ran that much better that, that I'm willing to just think she can dominate her from the 11 post, I guess. Uh, it, it's possible she could work out a trip, but it's one where I'm almost positive Magic Attitude's going to get a good trip. A couple other horses that I would consider um, are the number three, My Heart Belongs to Daddy, who I have to admit, I've never been a fan of this horse. I think she's gotten perfect trips in so many of her starts, and she's never run that impressive of a speed figure. But it does seem like she's going to get a perfect trip in this race. I know that the Time Form US Pace Projector is not characterizing this as a fast or slow pace, but... I've got to think that that My Heart Belongs to Daddy is going to be loose on a clear early lead. I don't see the number 10, Morning Molly, who's never been a speed horse going to the front. And My Heart Belongs to Daddy has been very successful with a front-running style. The only horse who's been successful with a front-running style in this race. So I have to think that she's going to be loose up front. I don't know if she's the best horse in this race. I'm f fairly certain she's not, but I think she might get the best trip. So I, I think that she's pretty dangerous in here. Um, and the horse that if I had to make a top pick would be the number eight, Miss Tehran for Chad Brown. She's kind of the second stringer for the Chad Brown Bart in this race behind counterparty risk. But I think that she's a little bit underrated coming into this. Um, she did not get the best trip three back in the forever together uh, when it seemed like she had plenty of run at the top of the stretch and her rider just continued to, to alter course and ride her into traffic. That trip didn't work out for her. Um, she did finish behind My Heart Belongs to Daddy, but I think it would have been closer if Miss Tehran had gotten a clear run. Two back, Joel Rosario tried to do the right thing in the Robert Frankel, but um, he moved a little soon coming up the rail, trying to take advantage of an opportunity when the rail opened up, but just used her move too soon on the far turn. And last time out, she was facing much weaker competition at Gulfstream, but I would go watch that race if you haven't seen it. She was so impressive coming from the back of the pack. Nobody else made a big run from, from far behind in that race, and she just blew by the leader who looked home free at the top of the stretch. I think that she's pretty dangerous stepping back up in class. So if I had to make a top pick, it would be Miss Tehran over Micheline and my heart belongs to daddy. Well, good info because I, I haven't seen that race. So I am going to go watch that before Saturday. Moving on to that derby prep down in Florida this weekend, the grade two Tampa Bay Derby. Uh, mile on the 16th, the same distance of the Sam F. Davis, which was the prep for this. And Craig... I've got to say, this is a pretty disappointing field. Of the three derby preps we're going to talk about, this, to me, is by far the weakest field. And we've got the two favorites who are coming out of the Sam F. Davis. I was anticipating that they were going to step up into a tougher spot in this grade two event, but I'm not sure that's actually the case. Yeah, I think our notes might look a little bit similar. This race got a big, 12, a big field of 12 Uh for those that do use Timeform US, I was a little thrown when I saw at the bottom that the race favorite was also entered. But then I looked, it's it's in the Kentucky Derby future pool. So he's clearly going to run here. I couldn't figure out for the life of me what KDF was for a couple minutes until it dawned on me. I don't play those things, so I had no idea there was even a uh, pool this weekend. Uh, that said... The one thing I remember after the Davis was thinking the T Tampa Bay Derby would be right for a shipper to pick off, assuming a couple would show up, probably from Gulfstream. Um, but as, as you said, it's not the most... Uh, the, the shippers in this race are a bit underwhelming, uh, to be fair. Um, the Davis was a slow race for the class, uh, and the one three finishers from that race are the top two morning line choices. So... 
despite my my hesitance with the uh, the shippers, I'm still going to try to beat those horses because I, I just wasn't that impressed with the Davis at all. Uh, I didn't see any reason to think they're suddenly going to run 10 points higher. So I, I think it's a pretty open race. Uh, I still, it's pretty fresh in my memory what happened last year in this race in what was a better field. So I am going to look elsewhere. Uh, the first shipper that I saw when I looked was the one coming in from Puerto Rico, the uh, the two horse super strong. I actually did go on YouTube and watch his race just because, I mean, it is Safi Joseph. He wins a lot of races at Gulfstream. So I wanted to see if I wanted to give this horse a shot, but Personally, I wasn't all that impressed. The horse has only run once uh, that I could find in our PPs. It was a grade one in Puerto Rico, but that horse isn't for me. I suspect he'll probably even get bet more than we suspect based on the morning line. Um, another horse I tried to make a case for was King of Dreams. He comes from that same Juan Avila barn that won this race last year with the horse we'll talk about later, King Guillermo, that's in the uh, Santa Anita Handicap. But hard as I tried, I, I just couldn't make a case for him. I, I think he's probably more of a turf force, his breeding points that way. I mean, some of his siblings have run okay on the dirt, but I mean, a 20 to 1 morning line, maybe I'll throw a couple bucks on him, but I don't love him either. The horse I eventually landed on was one I saw you mention on, on Twitter that you don't particularly like. And I, I don't love him, but I think Awesome Jerry has, has a good a shot as anybody in here. I thought his race in the uh, Mucho Macho Man Stakes where he was third to Mutasa Beak was a decent effort. I mean, it wasn't great, but he got a 110 speed figure, which is better than what anybody else in this field has run, uh, other than a horse far on the outside sitting on go, and, and I don't trust Trust him at all, and uh, what I the couple things I do like. One, I think you can put a line through his holy bull. Couple reasons: one, he was just over his head, and, and two, he drew the far outside at a distance where it's very hard to win from the outside, particularly for a horse that has early speed. And I also like the fact that he's taken blinkers off. I, I don't think it was a very good experiment with this guy. I, I think he's more likely to run well from three, four lengths off the lead and, and try to finish up in here. So I'm going to go with a price horse and awesome Jerry. Yeah, maybe I was a little quick to dismiss Awesome Jerry. I mean, given how slim the pickings are, I'm not going to knock him if he's around that 15 to 1 morning line. Um, there are definitely some things to like about him. It's certainly an easier spot than he faced in the Holy Bowl last time. Uh, so I have no problem with that selection. Um, and I'm not going to criticize anything in this race at a price because I landed on Candyman Rocket quite reluctantly this is not the kind of horse that i usually gravitate towards rather this is the kind of horse that i usually try to beat um i certainly expected to be trying to beat him coming into this race because i have the same impress impression as you of that sam f davis thinking i want to bet against the horses coming out of that race next time but sometimes when you see how the field comes up you have to reassess that initial opinion and these horses from the Sam F. Davis, they might not have to run any faster to win this Tampa Bay Derby because everybody else just hasn't run that fast themselves. So I don't know. Candyman Rocket, he, he looked okay in that race. He spurred it away at the top of the stretch, got a little leg weary late, but at least he handled the distance. And I just think he's the horse to beat again. Um, I guess Hidden Stash is going to be a threat if there's pace up front. Um, but I, I've talked about this in the past. I don't like that this horse refuses to change leads in his races, and it just seems to kind of uh, affect his late run as he tends to peter out towards the end of his races, even when it looks like he's got some momentum built up at the top of the stretch. So I'm a little skeptical of him and the others, I and mean, they just don't do it for me. Um, that horse you mentioned, super strong coming in from Puerto Rico, you can look up that field and formulator. You can actually browse the charts like you can with any other race in the United States. And um, you can see who he beat. They, they don't look like much. And I've watched some of his workouts since then. He just doesn't look like anything special to me. So, I mean, I know some people are going for this horse. I don't get it at all. I don't think he's a contender in this race. Um, Todd Pletcher's coming in with a couple of runners that just broke their maidens. If you look up the stats in Formulator, this is a terrible move for Todd Pletcher. Maiden winners last out that are three-year-olds stepping into graded stakes. He has just an abysmal record with these horses, so I'm very skeptical of Unbridled Honor or Promise Keeper taking a step forward. I guess Promise Keeper is the more convincing one because he ran a faster race last time. 
but he did so in the slop, got a good uh, front running trip that day. I think it's going to be tougher to work out a similar trip in this spot. And unbridled honor does have a win over the track, but he won a pretty slow race beating a pitiful field. So I just couldn't latch on to any of them. And I went back to the favorite Candyman Rocket pretty reluctantly. Yeah, no problem with that. I'm glad you brought up, brought up the Pletcher horses because I was going to mention that. I mean, he's a guy that's had some success in this race. Uh, I think he even won with Always Dreaming, if I'm not mistaken, who went on to win the Derby. But yeah, I just don't see it with these two horses. Moving out to California for our final destination on this forecast. It's the San Felipe, the third of the derby preps that we're going to talk about. Grade two event going a mile in the 16th for the three-year-olds. And this is clearly the highest quality prep race that we're going to talk about. Some top three-year-olds contesting this uh, grade two event. Bob Baffert obviously has a strong hand in here with Life is Good, the prohibitive favorite on the morning line, and his second stringer, Medina Spirit, both running in this spot. Life is Good, many consider him to be the top Kentucky Derby contender out there. I think along with Essential Quality and Greatest Honor, he's at the top of most people's lists. But this is going to be a real test for Life is Good. It's obviously the toughest field that he's faced so far, and it's the longest distance that he's had to contend with. So we'll see if he gets a real challenge in this race. What do you make of him and whether or not you want to take him at a very short price? I don't want to take him at a very short price. He's he's obviously very talented, but I... I... I don't consider him a, a real derby threat. Uh, maybe I'll wind up eating my words. I know Authentic kind of burned me last year, but he just doesn't have the look of a mile and a quarter horse to me. Uh, he draws the rail, which means his hand's kind of going to be played. It is going to be interesting to see what happens with him and his stable mate Medina Spirit. Uh, we saw the last time they met up where the rider on Medina Spirit just kind of ceded the lead to him after outbreaking him. But... I'm not even sure that's going to matter too much with Medina Spirit drawn outside. He proved how game he was last time out, dueling in those really fast fractions in the Lewis and being able to hold off Roman Centurion. Um, so I've been really impressed with him. Uh, of the two Bafferts, uh, I definitely prefer him, and, and mostly from a value standpoint. I mean, it's not going to shock me if life is good wins. It's only uh, a sixteenth of a mile longer than last time, but I know we talked about it on the pace cast. I actually really did think Medina Spirit was getting to him late that day. Uh, I know a lot of people were saying how geared down he was, but I just didn't buy it as much. But that said, there's definitely some other horses to talk about in here. We have the super impressive maiden winner, Dream Shake, uh, who actually ran a 120 time form U.S. speed figure first time out. Uh, he could be any kind of horse. I mean, it's really hard to say at this point, but... You know, it's a, he's going to be, a, I mean, he's not going to be the favorite. He may very well be the third choice, but I'm not sure I want that. And, and just his second start, taking a huge jump in class, first time around two turns. He did have a good setup last time as well. It's not like he uh, overcame any adversity. He, he got a really nice pace set up that day, super fast pace fraction. So I'm a little bit against that one in here, despite his big figure that he ran. Um so far, I wish we had more horses run back from his maiden race to, to see if maybe it was a strong race, but there's only been one, and I think it was a last place finisher, and he came back on turf and ran poorly again, so not really a whole lot to go on in that one. Uh, then we have the great one who had lost by a nose to, by, to, uh, to Spielberg in the low South Futurity as a maiden. He came back in a maiden race. He romped by 15 at Santa Anita, got a 115 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, the one thing I, I noted in this is that the horse who he battled with for the lead, didn't really battle with. He just kind of sat off of him. But Fenway, uh, that one kind of packed it in. But that one came back and ran a much better race second time out, cracking the uh, triple-digit speed figure. So I think he's a contender as well. And then there's Roman Centurion, who ran a decent figure last time, got a 111 when he almost caught Medina Spirit. So for me, this is just a really deep, strong race. But I'm going to stick with Medina Spirit. I just thought he was super game last time when he was forced to go from the rail, got pressured, set a super fast pace. And this time, I think he's going to be able to get a much nicer, more relaxed trip. And, and I just think he's really talented and has been underrated all along. 
Yeah, we have very similar thoughts in this race, so I won't be redundant with my analysis. I just echo most of what you said. Um, just a couple things that I have to add. Uh, life is good. I worry about him running off in the early stages of this race. I know that the pace projector has Medina Spirit as the only horse that's shown close to him, and conventional wisdom would be that the two Bob Bafferts are not going to go after each other because that's what happened in the sham. Medina Spirit took back, as you noted, Craig. But life is good. He still ran off, and he set a pretty honest pace all by himself. And that's just this horse's nature. He's very high strung. Um, he tends to maybe run too fast in the early going and that could start to to um catch up with him as he goes longer distances and i know that some have watched his workouts and said oh it looks like he's he's moderating that that high strung nature a little bit um but i think that's mostly due to the fact that bob baffert has stopped working him in company he's been working him solo mostly because life is good couldn't handle working in company with another horse he would just get really rank and not be able to finish when he did so this horse has some character flaws to him if he's going to make the Kentucky Derby. And I think Bob Baffert has to sort those out. And breaking from the rail here, they've got to send him away a little bit. And I just I just worry that he's not going to be able to rein in that speed. And Mike Smith is not the kind of rider that fights a horse on the front end. He just lets them go and drops his hands. So I'm a little concerned about life is good going too fast on the front end. And Craig, we're on the same page. I like Medina Spirit a lot. If I was making a Derby top 10 list, which is not something I do, Medina Spirit would have long been at the top of it. Uh, I've been impressed with every start this horse has put forward. I agree with you. He was getting to life as good at the end of the sham. Mike Smith was asking that horse and he was not responding once he was tiring. And Medina Spirit was just ultra game in that Robert Lewis last time, battling back on the inside. I liked Roman Centurion in that race. I still think that horse has the potential to get better, but he had every shot to get by Medina Spirit. Spirit and Medina Spirit just turned him away. I'm a fan of this horse, and uh, I think he's going to run really well on Saturday. So we'll see what we get from the two Bafferts, but we're on the same page with Medina Spirit. Moving on to the Frank E. Kilrow grade one event going one mile on the turf course. And this is another highly competitive turf race that we're going to discuss. Uh, there's not a ton of speed signed on for this race, and I think that's something we have to kind of begin with because the number one smooth like straight is shown on a clear lead on the pace projector in a situation favoring the early leader, and that's going to make him fairly dangerous here because the majority of his main competitors are late closing types. Yeah, I would agree with that. When I went through the race, my first inclination was I wanted to go against the two inside horses as newly turned four-year-olds who hadn't run a, as fast as some of the horses on the outside that we're going to talk about, namely Flavius and Casa Creed and, and Ride a Comet. But I do think this is a major tactical advantage for, for Smooth Like Straight in here, particularly over the Santa Anita course, which is definitely more speed friendly than a lot of the ones we see on the East Coast, even Gulfstream where the weather's good. Uh, so he's going to be my top pick in here. Uh, assuming he's anywhere near that that morning line, I would bet him. He gets the best turf rider in California and, and uh, Rispoli. And I just think it's a really tough uh thing for the others to overcome uh somebody's gonna have to take out of their running style to to really give him a go so he's the one for me some others that i, I would be interested in ride a comet has been just fabulous since he came back from his his long layoff of i think it was almost or might have even been over two years he's ran nothing but big speed figures so of the others he does at least have some tactical speed particularly at the mile he was up pretty close i think he's the main danger to smooth like straight um Casa Creed's done very little wrong. He's hung up some really big speed figures, but he had no real excuse to lose the ride to Comet. Uh, ride to Comet. He was only beat a half length, but he had his measure. He had taken the lead and just couldn't hold him off. So it's hard for me to picture a scenario where I would think he would beat Ride to Comet. I mean, anything can happen on turf. You get some crazy trips sometimes, but. You know, it, it's just, he's the better horse, in my opinion. The other horse, Flavius, comes in for Chad Brown. He's a horse who does nothing but run 125 time form U.S. speed figures. And if it wasn't for the tactical advantage to smooth like straight in this spot, I, I would actually like him a lot, particularly at that 6-1 to one morning line. So those are the ones that interest me. Hit the Road is the four-year-old I'm the least interested in. When I watched his race last time, uh, 
I, I was pretty blown away, to be honest, visually. He ran really well, obviously, but he only got a 117 time form U.S. speed figure. I will say he won so easily on turf. Uh, maybe he does have more in the tank, but that's never something that I want to bet on on a horse that's going to get bet. The one wild card with regard to the pace projector and smooth like straight getting a perfect trip, I think, is the number 10 Flying Scotsman, because that's a horse that the pace projector is not capturing accurately because there are no pace figures for his last race. And that was a race where it appeared that he was setting an honest pace, but there was a timing malfunction at Gulfstream and they removed all the fractions from the chart. Um, Craig, you I know you had to time that race from video and make a figure for it, um, but he is a horse horse that you would imagine would be much closer in the pace projector to smooth like straight if that last race did have pace figures and given that he ran a career best effort last time getting a very aggressive ride from Corey Lannery I would have to imagine that the instructions to Tyler Bays are going to be send this horse at all costs so that could perhaps prevent smooth like straight from getting the lead and smooth like straight is a horse that's been content to stalk in many of his races so he could be stalking in this race and do just fine but i'm not sure that the pace projector is going to play out exactly as it appears yeah and i did take that into consideration i just think smooth like straight is a horse that if a horse like the 10 challenge him, he's still going to save all the ground. I don't think he's going to run too fast. He might even let that one go and tip out a little bit, but I just think he has that tactical advantage over the rest of his rivals in here. I also, I'm not sure I, I totally trust Flying Scotsman to go. I mean, who knows what Tyler Bays is going to do when you look at his past performances. He's never made the lead early in his life before that. Granted, the, the last race is probably always the most important but and from the 10 hole you would think he should go but I, I almost wonder if that one was an aberration and it's hard to say how fast he was really going yeah I'm just thinking about the way that these connections often often process situations like that and I, in my opinion you know they always base their decisions so much on what happened last time and they saw that they were successful sending so I, I can't fathom that they're going to rate this horse I have to think he's going to be sent very aggressively in this race so we'll see about that um, how fast he really is I think that's that's the wild card I don't know if he is as fast as booth like straight um, as for the horses that I'm interested in in this race from a wagering standpoint um, Craig we have some Similar thoughts about horses like Hit the Road, uh, who was visually impressive last time, but I have those similar concerns about the step up in class and the fact that he hasn't really run a speed figure yet that puts him in the mix here. So I, I, I respect him, but I just feel like he might be um, undervalued in this race. As for Casa Creed and Ride a Comet, who come out of that fast race at Gulfstream, I thought they both got pretty good trips in there. Uh, Casa Creed maybe is liable to get a better trip here because he has a more natural tactical speed than Ride a Comet. That said, they were both 2-1 to one in that race, um, and that just wasn't the strongest field for me. I know that it got a very fast speed figure, but I think kind of like Hit the Road, they're going to have to do it against a better field in here. So I'm just a little concerned about these horses not being able to handle the class test. Um, again, less so for Casa Creed because he's run competitively in grade one races before, just not often winning them. Uh, the horse, horses that interest me quite a bit, um, one of them is Flavius, who you touched upon. Uh, he got a wide trip in the um, the Seabiscuit last year and I just think the mile and the 16th proved a little too long for him in that race to me he is a a miler at heart and he just couldn't quite see off the distance there but he was beaten by a good horse and count again who might be most compromised if the pace is slow here because he's a deep closer but Flavius can get the first run on some other horses in here so I think he's a contender and the horse that interests me the most, who I think is going to be dismissed at a bit of a price in here, is the number three, Social Paranoia, coming in for Todd Pletcher. Uh, this horse, he does have some tactical speed. I know that they rode him from the back of the pack in some races last year, but he was kind of keyed up last time in the Pegasus World Cup turf. That was going a longer distance, but he um, was paced, placed closer to the pace than he's been in a while. And I thought he ran very well in that race. The mile and three sixteenths is probably pushing him beyond his limit. Uh, but he got a wide, uncovered trip every step of the way, made the first move at the top of the stretch and got there, but was run down by horses who got much better trips like Colonel Liam and, and Largent, both of his stable mates. But I thought that was a real step back in the right direction for social paranoia. And this is a horse that has back class. He's run big speed figures before. So I think he's dangerous and I feel like he's going to be a price in this spot. 
Yeah, I've got no problem with him. I, I do think he needs some pace. I think that being up close last time maybe was just being a distance that's much longer than he's used to running. But if he does get some pace, he certainly has a good finishing kick. Let's close things out with the Santa Anita Handicap feature race on Saturday at Santa Anita. Grade one event going a mile and a quarter. And the big question in this race is what do we get from Maxfield as he tries to keep his undefeated record intact? Coming back on relatively short rest for him because he's a horse that typically has gotten a lot of time between starts, but also contesting grade one company for the first time since he won that Breeders' Futurity as a two-year-old. A lot of questions for this horse to answer as he's stepping up to face some horses who have run faster speed figures than he has. Yeah, he is. This is a, a really tough race, in my opinion. It drew a field of eight. It's good to see it get some uh, some name horses, particularly Maxfield, in here, because I think it's a race that's been down in recent years. I mean, it was one got by Combatant to nosed out Multiplier last year, which sounds more like a listed stake than the San Anita Handicap, but this one looks much better, and I'm really not sure what direction to go with Maxfield. Uh, it's odd that he's coming back so quickly. Uh, we haven't seen that. I think he's in this spot because his um, the other horse we talked about from Oakland, who won, whose name I forget, is going to the Dubai World Cup. So I think it's you. You had hinted at that that they were is probably my why Maxfield is coming here. But as you said, he, he doesn't really have any speed figure edge over the field. He's younger than a lot of them in here. So uh, I didn't try to beat him last time, but I'm going to try to beat him this time. Um, I'll start with Independence Hall because he has much the fastest speed figure in that Pegasus World Cup. He got a 131 that day. I will say for, for some reason, I've yet to been able to figure out the also Rans always seem to get huge figures in that race that they have trouble reproducing. But I'm not totally against Independence Hall in here. He finally seems to, to have refound some form. Uh, he's moving in the right direction. He's still a lightly race four-year-old. So I do think he's got a pretty big shot in here but the horse I eventually landed on was uh, the six horse idol in here he's a horse who had won the San or got beat by kiss today goodbye into San Antonio by half length after a pretty impressive allowance win and then he went favored I believe in the San Pascal and I just thought he got a terrible ride that day when there was no pace he regressed to a 117 speed figure but I'm looking for a horse who can run in the mid 120s to win this race and be good enough to max field and he's won as a uh, still a lately race four-year-old that I think can make the jump. And he's definitely going to offer some value compared to some others. So he will he would be my top pick, uh, Idol. And, and I do think Independence Hall is going to run well also. Yeah, I'm not surprised that we have very similar thoughts on this race. The turnaround for Maxfield to me is is a little weird in the sense that they're almost handling Mystic Guide like he's the better horse for Godolphin, even though I think most people would assume that Maxfield's the better one. I'm not most people, and I, I, I'm a much bigger fan of Mystic Guide than I am Maxfield, and I think Mystic Guide's a better horse. So he's, in my opinion, the one that should be going to Dubai to win the bigger purse there. Um, it, it just feels like they're handling Maxfield like they know he's not going to be around forever. Like, maybe they're running him back on short rest because they feel like, okay, he's doing okay now. Let's try to get the grade one while we can because who knows what's going to happen by November. So, I don't know. I, I just feel like they're... I don't totally trust Maxfield, and I've never been thrilled with the fact that he hasn't taken that big step forward from a speed figure standpoint. Uh, I know that he got that 121 last time in the time form U.S. speed figures. That's a figure that we talked about quite a bit, Craig, and, and I know we kept them as is, but I felt like that number could have been a little lower as the Louisiana Derby, I mean, not, not the Louisiana Derby, the Risen Star looked like it might have been a faster race, um, at least to me. Uh, so I'm just not sure that Maxfield's been facing company that classes up with these horses and that he's really capable of taking the step forward that he needs to from a speed figure standpoint. So I'm I'm against Maxfield in this spot. Um, and I would go to the same horses that you mentioned, Craig. Independence Hall, I don't really buy that 131 speed figure he got last time. I think I think that's a number that makes sense for Nick's go and nobody else. Uh, so 
like you said, your hands are kind of tied because it was a race that came up very fast as the Pegasus often does for whatever reason. I don't know if the track changed for that one race or not. Um, Nixco obviously came back and did not run well at all in the Saudi Cup. Um, but I'm a little skeptical of that figure. But even if that number is eight points too high, I mean, Independence Hall would be a contender in this race based on a, a 123 or 124. And uh, he's a horse that always had talent. And obviously he didn't put it together for a long time, but his last race was good. His last workout, if you watched it on XBTV, was dazzling. He It looks like he's just doing very well right now. I'm not sure about a mile and a quarter for him. I, I think he's probably more of a mile to mile and an eighth kind of horse. But if he's in top form, maybe he can do it against this field. So I, I would use him. But like you, Craig, the horse that I'm most interested in or the one that'll be the best price of the ones that I'm considering is the number six idol. Uh, we've talked about this horse on the pace cast. We both liked him in some prior starts. Uh, we agreed about the trip last time. There was just no urgency shown by his rider, Gabriel Saez, who basically let him lollygag at the back of the pack behind a slow pace and basically started asking him way too late. And he was running on to the end of that race, but was just giving up too much of a deficit to his main rival express train who's back in here. I think both of these horses have a right to get a mile and a quarter, but I think a mile and a quarter is a much more natural fit for idol who to me looks like a horse that really wants to run all day. He's this big long striding son of Curlin who just, just gobble up the ground going a mile and a quarter and the rider switched to draw Rosario. Well, you know that I like that. So uh, to me, he's the right horse to take it, which should be a much better price than the other horses talked about yeah i didn't mention the rider switch because obviously if you don't like a rider horse got and they get the same jockey it's not as good of a, an upgrade but if i had to pick one jockey in the country to ride this horse i mean joel rosario just seems custom made to ride this one so that was a big part of, of my pick in this one uh i do think this is going to be a, a fun race uh, as you mentioned i did want to touch on the speed figures for the pegasus again it's something i we do it on turf where we realize that if the pace is super fast, it always it tends to lead to an inflated final time figure, and we kind of knock those back. And it's almost something I see in some of these races on dirt where the same thing seems to happen, where just because the pace is fast, I mean, horses kind of get sucked along to uh, fast figures that they can't produce when they are running in a more normal race. Uh, this is something you see with humans as well, uh, if, if anybody finds follows track and field they enter a rabbit just to, to get the the people to run faster times and you see it in harness racing as well i don't know how much you followed harness racing but i used to a long time ago and there were many horses who would just kind of get sucked along the career best times but when they were on their own or trying to win races they couldn't reproduce them so it is something i'm constantly looking at and trying to make better and the pegasus is almost like a perfect uh, test ground not just this year Year, but for three or four years going backwards, I've seen this happen several times. That's a really good point about pace affecting those races on the dirt, not the way you'd expect faster paces leading to faster final times. Um, it's a good point, and it's a phenomenon that we do sometimes see in these races. Uh, and we'll see what how good Nick's go turns out to be later in the year. I know that I have my doubts about him. I thought some people were significantly overrating him off that Pegasus score, even though that race had the Pegasus name on it. It was not your typical Pegasus field. So we'll see how good that race ultimately turns out to be. But you make some good points about uh, how how the speed figures work out in those situations. Yeah, I think there's some comparisons to be made between a horse like Nick's Go and Maxfield and that Nick's Go's reputation was basically earned on races where he beat Jesus's team and Maxfield has done nothing really but beat Sonam in the last couple times. And even if you look back at, at his three-year-old season, the horse he's beat that he beat just haven't gone on to do very much so he hasn't run fast he hasn't beat much he can win but I think he's a horse uh, as a better that you just have to take a shot against and you're going to be right more often than not I'll take Jesus's team over Sonam in any day of the week you'll you'll never find me knocking Jesus's team he is one cool horse but I hear your point that that's completely true about Nick's go beating horses that aren't really on his level so so we'll see about how that race turns out in the future 
Well, it was a packed show this week. A lot of races to discuss. Hopefully we gave out some good opinions. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how all of this shakes out. And we'll obviously do a recap of all of these races on the Time Form US Pacecast next Tuesday. Remember, you can always listen to us on DRF.com, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Wherever you get your podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Thanks for listening this week and stay tuned for that Time Form US Pacecast on Tuesday.